protests led by Hindus outside of the BBC HQ in London is making waves. This is big news, both in India and around the world. My name is Vaibhavi Nai, and I will be discussing this with Pandit Satish K. Sharma ji. Namaste, Pandit ji. How are you doing? Ram ji, namaskar. Jai Shri Ram to you, Vaibhavi ji. Uh, we're actually doing very well here in the UK. Um, a little bit exhausted, an awful lot has happened over the last week. And I, I think the, the global Twitter space has been buzzing and YouTube space has been buzzing about news about what's been happening in London. So yes, it's great to have an opportunity to catch up and just synchronize and, uh, and update everybody on how far we've got. So it's a pleasure. Thank you for organizing this. Look forward to our conversation. The feeling is mutual, Pandaji. Let's let's dive right into the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that you were present at the protest held against the BBC outside of their global headquarters in London yesterday. Um, can you tell us what happened and what was it about? Yes, uh, for a long time, anybody who is an observer of the BBC and their reporting, um, they will confirm that the BBC's coverage of anything to do with Bharat and anything to do specifically with Hindus has always been a little bit off balance. Even if there's some good news, it's always accompanied by some snipe or some criticism, some veiled jibe or uh, uh, some, some element of vilification is always present. And the, the old tropes that were p sort of proliferated during colonial times, they all suddenly creep into any report that the BBC does. And so this we've known for a long time. And many people in the United Kingdom, most of whom are taxpayers, and they, they pay a small tax to the BBC every year. Um, and it's a compulsory taxation if you use live broadcasting. And so it's not as though we choose to do it, it's in law. And most of us pay this. Many of us have objected on numerous occasions to the BBC objecting about the lack of bias, the lack of, uh, sorry, the lack of uh, transparency, the, uh, the apparent bias and bigotry, the prejudice, the proliferation of tropes. They always talk of caste and curries and cows and the, the, the usual nonsense that has been um, pervaded, uh, pervading the space. But we've never managed to get them to make a change. They've always come up with some sort of rhetoric which said, no, 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 this is uh, subjective, this is opinion, this is editorial, etc." We've known that this is what they were doing. But then Leicester happened. And shockingly, the BBC's coverage in Leicester was the worst coverage I think I've ever seen of any broadcasting newspaper and uh, media organization. On the one hand, there were documented crimes committed against Hindus. Hindus were targeted for being Hindus. Hindu homes and mandirs were directly targeted. And so this was clearly religiously motivated. They were acts of criminality. And so these are therefore hate crimes. They happened in front of the, the nation's cameras. They were broadcast on um, uh, social media as well as on uh, television stations. So they happened. They were facts. They were indisputable. On the other hand, there was a wave of rhetoric and social media broadcasting, which was propaganda and it was completely false. I'm sure many of our watchers will have seen the false claims that Hindu boys were kidnapping uh, a Muslim girl and the police proved that was completely nonsense. That a mosque was attacked, that was completely nonsense. And there was a string of these allegations that Hindus were actually engaging in criminality and that they were the instigators None of that was borne out by evidence. And yet what the BBC did is it jumped onto those elements of fake news, those propaganda snippets, and broadcast and published them as though they were fact-checked. And this was the, uh, the dramatic um, change. We couldn't quite believe it. It was journalism. Um, it was incompetent journalism on a scale that we had never seen before, and that is being generous. If we were more critical, we would say that it was targeted hate speech and propaganda, which the, the BBC knowingly broadcast in order to tarnish the, the name of the, of certainly of Leicester's Hindu community, but Hindus generally. 
And so what happened is a whole group of people started to monitor what was going on. We saw that this was an attack on us. Lots of community organizations came together, started to, one, rebuild some sort of semblance of normal life in the areas where Hindus had been attacked, to support the people who had been attacked, but also to start our own monitoring, to start our own documentation of the events that had occurred. And so we have a very robust body of evidence of actually what happened on the ground. And so the BBC, in good old colonialist fashion, didn't really acknowledge that this was a, a fault of theirs. They didn't acknowledge their complicity in um, concealing what had happened. And so what happened is a lot of Hindus got together and thought, no, we mustn't let this pass. This is a clear case of Hindus being targeted for being Hindus, and then the BBC covering it up. So in some of the notes that I've written, I've actually stated that the BBC, as far as I'm concerned, has been complicit in concealing attempts of ethnic cleansing of Hindus from that area of Leicester. And that's quite an allegation to make, but the evidence does support it. The protest that was organized was to bring this to the attention of the senior management in the BBC. The BBC is one of those big organizations, and we can be generous, and let's assume that um, the higher ups have got no clue what, of what's going on. It's a very, very large organization. And so we thought we needed to bring it to their attention. And so a memorandum was put together. And the crux of the memorandum was to basically identify what had happened in Leicester and to clarify what was wrong with the BBC's coverage. That was one thing that was handed to them. The second thing that was handed to them was a definition of Hindu phobia, anti-Hinduism, um, prejudice and bias against Hindus, hate speech against Hindus. It was all def defined in a very, very clear document. And that was also presented to the BBC. So we gave them the evidence to show that they had been Hindu phobic or um, Hindu misia was the, uh, the, the, the manner in which they acted. But we also then gave them a clear definition of what that means, how it's identified and how it can be determined as to whether it occurred or not. And those were handed in to the BBC. And I, I must say, I was so impressed with the way in which the protesters gathered. They held, we had the moral high ground, they maintained the moral high ground. It was a protest which was very civilized, very, very pleasant and uh, very, very powerful. Largely, it was a silent protest, but um, the message was delivered. And so I think we're, we're quite positive. We're hoping the outcome will be equally positive. We hope the same. Um, Panditji, now you spoke, uh, you spoke about uh, the reason behind, the motive behind the protest, but do you think that the drive um, behind the protest is still just whatever happened in Leicester or is it the ongoing propaganda in general or is it a bit of both? I think the Leicester events have become a catalyst. In future years to come, people will look back and notice that Leicester was probably the straw that broke the camel's back. And it wasn't just a small straw, it was a log in terms of what actually happened. And so it's it really did spur our community into action. They realized that one, we were being attacked, acts of violence were being inflicted on Hindus in Leicester of all places where we have um, the largest Hindu community in the United Kingdom. And the shock of it was that not only were those attacks occurring and the police were standing as witnesses to them, they weren't stepping forward to intervene and protect persons and, and property, but then the way in which it was reported was completely false. So the, the, the confluence of all of those individual elements came together to create a clear understanding for all British Hindus and Hindus that here in the United Kingdom, it was possibly for us to be targeted for criminality, for the authorities to then cover it up, and for the BBC, the national state broadcaster, to completely misrepresent everything that had happened. And these three events, I think, are very, very serious. They, they are an alarm. They are a call to the Hindu community and also the non-Hindu community. They're a crystal clear trumpet call to say, this is possible. Innocent citizens can be attacked and the pillars of the state and the government 
will actually deceive the public and hide what happened under certain circumstances. So that's what really brought it all together. And that's what we're now pressing forward for. Because even in this instance, in an instance when it's so close, it's so clear cut, when the um, evidence was, was available firsthand to the police authorities of what had actually happened. If in this case, British Hindus do not get justice, then I dread to think what the circumstances in the future hold for us. Absolutely, Banditji. Um, You spoke about um, presenting to the BBC a definition, a working definition of Hinduphobia. Would you would you like to expand on that? Um, can we can you share the definition of Hinduphobia? And mm. also, can you tell us what do you want the BBC to do with this definition? How do you think they can make amends? So we had an interesting situation where in the Houses of Parliament, uh, House of Commons, Bob Blackman stood and advised the House that this was a case of Hindu phobia. So the, the word has entered um, legal circles now. And when something is articulated in Parliament, it's recorded in Hansard, it becomes part of the public record, it will be, become part of the process whereby it will be recognised and enshrined in law at some stage. So once the word has been spoken, it then needs definition. Now, as a separate parallel track, there is a, a wonderful scholar, Sarah Gates in Australia, who recognised that there was a need for a robust definition. And so she started a project which our Global Hindu Federation had the opportunity and a privilege to support. And once the Leicester events happened, she accelerated her work, finished it off, and provided us with a copy of a definition which we think will withstand scrutiny. And it's reasonable, but it's completely legitimate. It has internal integrity, and it's robust enough for legislators to look at and to be able to produce good law. And so this definition, we sculpted it, uh, the, the last few stages were finished only a few weeks ago. And we had actually presented it to number 10, uh, Downing Street to the Prime Minister's office um, almost a month ago and that was one Prime Minister ago okay so that was uh, under Liz Truss's uh, um, premiership and so we presented it to them we also had presented it to the all-party parliamentary group on British Hindus to take further forward and so it's moving in the appropriate uh, direction to become more widely accepted but if you make a, an accusation then you need to be able to back it up with a definition of some description. And that's then what we have done. Now, the definition, if anybody wants to have a look at it, if you go to hinducampaigns.com, it's actually available to be downloaded free of charge straight from there. And the definition is very, very clearly uh, identified and articulated. You also asked me, what do we want from the BBC? We want the yes. BBC to function in a particular manner. We need the BBC to recognise that it has been biased in its reporting, that it has breached the terms of its charter. And once it recognises that, then what we can do is require the BBC to then put some sort of resources at our disposal to give us some sort of authority to rectify the systemic problems that, are, that we've identified. That's the only solution, really. Um, they need to recognize what they have done. They need to indicate remorse for it. They need to engage with us so that we can move towards restitution. And then we will get a, a stage of reconciliation. That's entirely reasonable. Um, I say the majority of the Hindus in this country, they contribute significantly to the BBC's coffers by paying them this tax every year. And so it's not an unreasonable request. That's what we want to have happen. Absolutely, Pandit um, we know now, we are aware of uh, these organizations about the way that they have misrepresented us and misrepresented our civilization as a whole. Now, what now? How do we hold them accountable? Now that we know about what, everything that they have done, how do we hold them accountable? Where do we go from here now? Where do we go here from now? So this is uh, vitally important to understand. As uh, British citizens in this particular instance, we have a great opportunity to hold these organizations accountable, more so than people who use the BBC service in other countries. Okay. 
So in the United Kingdom, we have, for example, something called the Nolan Principles. And these are principles which bind a person who is elected to office or is a civil servant or is engaged in running a charity and things of this sort. And they're principles of conduct, very, very clearly established. And let me give you an example. So the first principle is selflessness. So you have to act not for your own benefit. The next is integrity. What you say and what you do and so on, it has integrity. The third is objectivity, which is clear. Then there is accountability, followed by openness, followed by honesty, followed by leadership. So those are the seven principles, the Nolan principles. They were um, identified and uh, put into um, public use by Lord Nolan in 1995. Now, if we use these to look at the way in which the BBC has worked to present these cases, then the senior most management have been negligent in their duty to adhere to the Nolan principles. If we look at the way in which the Lord Mayor of uh, Leicester suddenly announced his judgment that it was Hindutva extremists who were party to what was going on, before the independent inquiry had even started, he has fallen foul of several of the Nolan principles. He then announced a, an academic, Dr. Chris Allen, to conduct the inquiry. And when we investigated further into Chris Allen's credentials and his past publications, it's apparent that he does not adhere to those principles as far as this particular issue is concerned. He is a biased person who has already published an opinion on what happened in Leicester long before an inquiry has uh, been undertaken. So, so these Nolan principles, they give us a great deal of um, power and a framework within which the Hindu community can now demand accountability. And I'm glad that I've had a chance to just identify those because every Hindu in the United Kingdom should now realize that this is how the lens, this is the lens that they should be using with which to scrutinize the public officials, because this issue is not over yet. You know, this um, inquiry has become so tainted by the events that have occurred, the manner in which prejudice has already reared its head, the apparent lack of um, objectivity and independence. This inquiry is tarnished beyond recovery. And last week, many mandirs in the Leicester area many Hindu organizations came forward and said, we have no confidence in this inquiry. And it's clear that an inquiry which is conducted by officials in Leicester cannot be trusted. And so what we really need is a royal commission. We need central government to take control of this issue and commission a report which is completely reliable and independent. And that's what the, the community, Hindu community should now be pressing forward for. And I think we've got a good chance of getting it because this Leicester case is textbook. Once <laughs> this is all settled down, future generations will look at it as a, a study in how not to do things in, in terms of public service. Very nicely put, Mindaju. Um, And adding to that question, we, as, as we had talked about the organizations mis misrepresenting us, Everything that they portray about us, it's based on lies. It's not, it's not just remotely false, but it's completely, completely false, complete, as far away from the truth as possible. Just how exactly are these organizations? They are, they are big. They have, they have this status and they are quite known across the world. But even at that, even being that big, how are they able to get away with it without any consequences? Because nobody asks them, because nobody holds them to account, because nobody puts them under scrutiny, sustained scrutiny, and demands accountability. By and large, our community have said, Tika Chaltaha, you know, we'll carry on doing our own thing until Iga, and sooner or later, people will recognize that we're good, decent people, and they will stop hounding us. It hasn't happened, and it's not going to happen. You know, many of these countries and these organizations, they have an adversarial nature. And so they are continuously looking 
to push the boundaries and uh, expand at the expense of other people. Jojita Vohisikandar is the way they work. And so they are always going to be attacking and accosting us, and we have to respond. And that's the only solution. If we do respond, we have the moral high ground. Justice is in our in our camp. Um, you know, this is a, a Kurukshetra, and we do have dharma on our side, and we do have um, right on our side. So all that's needed is for us to engage. And the better we engage, the better for everybody. Once again, very right said. Now, there has been, it is known to various resources that Hindus were ethnically cleansed um, in light of the recent events um, in Leicester. But the BBC has covered this up by blaming the Hindu community itself with their anti-propaganda, anti-Hindu propaganda. So how would you, what would you like to say about this? Well, I think the protest has really said everything that we needed to say. The protest was actually wonderful. We had an opportunity for everybody who was gathered there to voice their own opinion. So we had a diversity of opinions and uh, perspectives, but each and every one of those persons was crystal clear that the BBC had been negligent, and negligent to such a degree that it caused significant harm to our community. And so now the dominoes have started to tumble. Let's see what happens. The board have been invited to meet us and speak with us, and we can, I think we will actually press forward to get a, an improvement in the relationship. Once that's done with this instance, I think we set a precedent. And hopefully that precedent will be an example for other people as well in our community to wor work out that there is a toolkit which we can also use to make sure that we get justice. And that's that, that's going to be good. I think a precedence will be established and it needs to be established. And then we're a step forward. I'm, I'm actually quite confident that this is going to be good for the community and that it will help us to repair the damage that was done to the Hindu community and also to the other communities in Leicester by the way in which the BBC reported. Absolutely, Pandit uh, It has been such a pleasure to have you here and cover this event, which is so significant for all of us, the Hindu community, both in Leicester as well as around the world. Thank you again for your insights, and we hope to have more of these sessions in the future. Vibhavji, thank you very much. This is a live issue and it's ongoing, but it does have global ramifications. I noticed that the um, members of the government in India had also been following it and they would uh, picked up and responded to some of the communications that we had sent out. And, you know, the BBC, it does need to come into the 21st century. This relic from colonial times, which has this supercilious sort of snooty attitude, <laughs> It's a, a dinosaur, and hopefully it will evolve into a really good news service and not just a, a propaganda mouthpiece for the, the old British establishment. So it's an ongoing story, and I look forward to sharing it with you over the coming weeks. Thank you, Vaibhaviji. Thank you, Pandit Ji. Jai Shri Ram. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.